Luke chapter 1, uh, last week we were uh, engaged in learning about uh, what the birth of John the Baptist would be like, and this week we see the announcement of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to be hearing God's Word together, and so as a reminder, this is God's Word, not man's. If you are able, would you please stand? Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her own age, old age, and she who was said to be barren in her sixth, is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless this time that we have together as we think of and meditate on your word. And Father, we ask that your spirit would work in and through these words, that they would accomplish the task that you have set for them to do in our lives here today. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Last week, as I said, we went through uh, looking at the annunciation of the birth of John the Baptist, that there was this announcement of what John would do of what would happen to Zechariah and Elizabeth in their old age and what God would provide for them, but more importantly, what God was going to be providing for the people of Israel, his people, that John would be a forerunner for the Lord Jesus Christ who was coming into the world. And so today we consider the announcement of Jesus himself. And if you are working through, as we uh, work through the beginning of this Gospel of Luke, what we see is this ongoing comparison between John the Baptist and Jesus. We hear the announcement of John the Baptist being born, the announcement of Jesus being born. We hear about John being born and then Jesus being born. We hear about the ministry of John the Baptist and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in all of these, what we are meant to see is John is tremendous. John's amazing. It's amazing work that God is doing through this man and people are are coming to repentance through his ministry. But he doesn't compare in any way to how great and marvelous the Lord Jesus Christ is. And so, as Luke, as we remember from a couple weeks ago, is setting up for most excellent Theophilus, I want to give you an account. You've heard the stories, and we know John the Baptist has done great things, but Jesus is greater. Even as we look at the announcement of his birth, we see this together this morning. 
And so what we need to see is a couple things about this Messiah as Luke is recording this history for us. The first thing that we must see is that the Lord Jesus is a multifaceted Messiah. A multifaceted Messiah. If you take a diamond and you look through it and you see different things as you look through the different faces of that gem. But if you stand back and look at the whole gem, you see even a greater beauty. Well, as we look at the Messiah, as Gabriel has come to Mary, what he's laying out for her and for us is only a glimpse of what this Messiah is going to be like. And in fact, who he is to this day. The first thing that we see is that there's a humble location. The idea of a Messiah, the idea of someone coming to rescue the people of Israel was not something new. It was not something that was kind of off the radar. In fact, all of Israel was looking for who is going to deliver us from this oppressor. We look back to the Old Testament and God has been gracious to his people over and over again that when they fall away, he brings those that come into their lives, whether individually or as a nation, that bring really disaster so that they would call on his name and realize that they left him. And then what does God do? He brings deliverance to them. Whether it's in the person of Moses, or whether it's through the people uh, that we read about in the Judges, or whether it's through uh, even those that are returning after exile, we see the Lord providing for those that would lead. But what would we expect for someone who would be uh, the Messiah? We would expect someone who is great and powerful. And we know from the birth of Jesus that is not the case, but we also see that in the announcement. What we read is that the angel Gabriel goes to a virgin in the town of Nazareth. and Mary is her name. Now, Nazareth, as you'll remember, uh, when Philip has approached uh, Nathaniel in the Gospel of John and tells Nathaniel, hey, I see, I've met the Messiah, I've heard them from the Messiah, you have to come and hear this man, this man from Nazareth. And Nathaniel's response is, does anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, it might, you might as well say they came from Chicago. You might as well say they came from, you know, pick the town that you don't like particularly. You might say from Green Bay if you're from Chicago. But the reality is, God was not flippant about who he was going to. God was not unknowing about where this young woman was. God was not unaware of her lowly estate. In fact, it's a humble location. This virgin who was betrothed would deliver before the nuptials. Even in that day, that was a tremendously difficult thing. Something that would cause derision from those around her. And here, this is what is the timeline that God has set up. That this Messiah would come and come from a humble beginning. Not for any other reason except to show God's greatness. That's not according to human greatness, but according to his work in and through but we also see that this announcement that Gabriel is, is giving is that, uh, that this Messiah will be truly good. When the angel appears to Mary, he tells her two times, uh, blessed are you. He says uh, in the greeting, you're highly favored. He says God has found favor with you that this is a truly good thing that's happening to you, Mary. Not, not because you've wanted to be pregnant, as was the, is the case with your relative Elizabeth, but because you will bear 
the Son of God. You will bear the one who is fully man and fully God. You will be the one who cares for and gives birth to this Savior and Messiah. This is truly a blessing from God. It's showing that God is blessing Mary, not that Mary was blessed and so is receiving something in response to her estate and her status. No, she's, she's humble. There's nothing about her that would cause God to come to her and say that is the one who is deserving of the birth uh, to carry the Lord Jesus Christ. The favor that Gabriel is talking about here and the blessing that God, that Gabriel is pointing to is the reality that God has come to her. This is something that God is doing. All the language here is in the, is in the passive tense, meaning there's nothing Mary has done. There's nothing character that Mary carries with her except availability to what God is doing. The Messiah who is coming is truly good. Good in the best sense of the word. Good for not only the world that is going, but good for you, Gabriel says. This is a great honor because you will bear the Son of God. But it's also a desired Savior. Gabriel says, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Jesus being a somewhat common name in, in first century uh, Palestine. Uh, many people would be called Jesus. In fact, we have other recordings in our uh, New Testaments of, of those that have been called Jesus. But why is he called Jesus? Luke doesn't include this information, but Matthew does. When the, the angel comes to um, Joseph in a dream, and Joseph is contemplating whether or not he needs to divorce Mary and, and uh, walk away from her quietly because she's been found pregnant, Matthew, Matthew records for us that Joseph is told, you will give this son the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. This is a Savior that's desperately desired. This is one who is truly good because he will redeem the people of Israel, not even in the sense that, that the people want in that time, but what the true people truly need. And you've had this experience where you've approached a situation or you've gone into a setting and you say, this is what I really want. If everything could go this way, this is how it would play out. And how many times have you experienced when you've walked away from that saying, that's not how, what I, that's not how I expected it to go at all. That's not what I thought was going to go on. But what happened was so much better. It's God's grace for that. And so this desired Savior who will come uh, is going to be the only one in which there is found salvation. That's what we read in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This multifaceted Messiah is going to be gloriously good truly good, but he's also going to have true authority. Gabriel continues on dis displaying to Mary who this Lord Jesus is going to be. He will be great, in verse 32, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. You see, this Messiah will have the truest authority over all things that ever has been. And he will exercise that authority in the best way that anyone could ever exercise that authority. It doesn't take much for us to look around, even our current world, but you look through the passage of time and you see those who had really extensive authority and were not doing what was good. 
Maybe they thought they were achieving something good for humanity and carrying out some grand design. But by exercising that authority, they made a greater mess and brought more turmoil and more difficulty to humanity than was at the first. Jesus exercises true and good authority. Jesus, who is the eternal king, he will be divine. He will be the son of the most high. There will be none that will be above him. He will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But there's also a connection here back to David. There's a promise here that the true authority that God gives doesn't end. The, it continues on. He will be in the line of David. And that's what we read at the beginning as well of Mary. Uh, uh, sorry. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And so Gabriel says, he will be in the line of David. God promised David that there would be always a king sitting on his throne. We don't see that in the pages of Scripture. We see that being disrupted. And yet, God has not forgot his promise. God promises that there will be one who reigns, not just with uh, authority given by mankind as the people come around him, but one with true authority that comes from above, who will truly be the king and the prophet and the priest that Israel and God's people need. So there's all these angles to what and who this Messiah is going to be. There are all these aspects of what Jesus is going to be, and they don't even get the, 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 the portion of how many different things that Jesus is. But to give us a picture of what we need to know and what Mary needs to know in order to follow him. So we see this multifaceted Messiah, but we also see a, a miraculous um, Messiah. We see a supernatural advent here, something that God is doing on the computer. Um, so let me give them to you. In the supernatural advent of what Gabriel is giving to Mary, the first thing that we see is a miraculous conception. It's a miraculous conception. Mary recognizes this. Mary points this out to Gabriel. Now, we remember from last week, uh, our friend Zechariah also pointed out to Gabriel of a difficulty in the promise of what was being brought to him. In Zechariah's case, it was unbelief. We've been married for a long time here, Gabriel, and there have been no kids. We are well past the age of having kids. This is not going to happen. Mary's question is not, this can't happen. Mary's question is, how are you going to do this? I believe, but how are you going to do this? This doesn't make sense of how these pieces are going to come together yet. Mary does not doubt. She sees and believes what is being said to her, but she seeks understanding just how is this going to go forward. And so Gabriel explains. In terms that are for us, all we need to know, we can spend a lot of time, and people have spent a lot of ink, of saying, what does this happen in the metaphysical sense? And we're left with the reality that God's word has given us what we need. And we can trust where God's word ends of giving us the explanation. Gabriel says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. There is a divine inter intervention that will happen. And surely we understand that there's been a divine intervention in Zechariah and Elizabeth. It wasn't just that one time everything just finally clicked and Elizabeth became pregnant. But this is a divine intervention that baffles the human imagination. What is actually the context of this? How does this actually work? 
This is something only God can do. Even in our day, we, we have certain medical advancements where we can do different things with those that are struggling with infertility. But there is no way that we have any medical advancement that allows for someone to become pregnant. There's no way for a woman to become pregnant uh, without the regular biological process. But all things are possible with God. And so we see this miraculous conception that points to this supernatural advent. Something different is happening. You saw John the Baptist is going to be, be born to an older couple. Jesus is born to without a couple at all. Do you see how amazing Jesus is? Only God can do this. Paul writes to the Corinthian church and says, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you see God is at work? Do you know that God has always been at work? For those who have eyes to see, we see how God is at work in the Old Testament, how God is at work through the New Testament, how God is still at work even in our present day. We need to be aware of this, brothers and sisters in Christ. There there is always and will always be until the Lord returns questions over to what can God truly do. There's a miraculous conception, but it's also marked by power. Marked by power. That's God's work in this. This can't happen without him. This can't happen apart from his work. Now understand, uh, this year actually marks the 100th uh, anniversary of a uh, book that was published um, by J. Gresham Machen called Christianity and Liberalism. Uh, a, a little plug, if you don't have a devotional um, outlet at this point in time, uh, Table Talk is a great resource. And they have a, this month, if you don't have a copy of it, talk to somebody. I'm sure we'd be willing to share it. But they have a great, uh, several articles devoted to the, really the pushback on liberalism, not according to our politics, but liberalism in accordance to theology. And Gre Machen was, was fighting against a tide that would say it doesn't really even matter that there was a virgin birth because it doesn't really matter if Jesus even was really who he says he is. Because it's really the thoughts that really matter. It's the ideas that really persist. But we're left with this reality that if you don't believe what the Bible says, then you will be left with a God without wrath that brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. In other words, you will have no gospel at all. And so we need to hold true to the, the truths of God's word of marked by God's power. The sign that God gives is Elizabeth's pregnancy. She, Gabriel says she's in her sixth month. She who is said to be barren. You know, these things just do not happen. They don't. So Gabriel is pointing Elizabeth to say, look, nothing is impossible with God. This is marked by power, by God's power, not yours. It's not some incantation that you need to do. It's not some righteousness you need to attain to and then God will do it. No, God is doing this for the sake of his own glory and his own might, and he will accomplish it in your presence. Something is behind this, in other words. What's Mary's response? It, in response to this power that is displayed, that is marked, um, this Messiah who is marked by power, Mary's response is just submission. Submission to God's good plan. His glorious plan. M Mary says, 
You know what's good. And I trust you for it. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. So what are we supposed to do with this? We see this, we, we worship Christ, we understand um, what, he is, what he is, uh, who he is. We understand from uh, every Christmas season ever uh, the story of his birth that we'll get to in a couple weeks. But why the announcement? What do we do with this announcement? Well, one, I believe that we need to see Christ's identity. See Christ's identity. You need to see it. Not just say, oh yeah, that's, that's what I heard in church. Or, or yeah, that's what I know other people kind of believe, but it's not really dear to me. I can kind of see it in the peripheral vision of my eyesight. No, you need to gaze at Christ's identity, who he is, who he declares himself to be. He is the only one that truly is what he identifies himself as. Who he says he is, is who he is. But get this. He certainly is more than what's revealed in Scripture, but he is absolutely not less. What we see on the pages of Scripture of who Jesus is, this Messiah who has come to save, is certainly more than what we can understand or comprehend. He's the God of the universe. He created all things. All things hold together because of him and through him. He's certainly more than what Scripture reveals to us. But he is absolutely not less. When we read about the virgin birth, and I, and I hope that we would all understand, and in this place we would, would fully agree with what God's word says, but understand that in all of our minds there is these moments of doubt, and certainly people within our lives say, well, it's not really that big of a deal. That's kind of a supernatural thing. I'm not sure if I buy into all that supernatural stuff. Our call is to see Christ's identity, to care about this doctrine. It may seem kind of silly. Why is that really that important? Does it really change anything? But when you focus on, and when you look at what this actually means, you see it really unfold. In, in the book that I mentioned earlier, Liberalism, Liberalism and Christianity, Machen writes this. But if the Christian faith is based upon truth, then it is not the faith which saves the Christian, but the object of that faith. And the object of the faith is Christ. Faith, then, according to the Christian view, means simply receiving a gift. The salvation itself is an absolutely free gift from God. Nothing that you do not of your works. This is a free gift from God. And so what is your response? See Christ. That's all. See Christ's identity. That's something that we will, for those who are in Christ, something that we will do for the rest of eternity. See Christ as who he is. Does that excite you? on some level of understanding, if you are satisfied with just what we see on, um, in, in, in the common cultural milieu of who Christ is, you will not be satisfied. But if you look at who Christ is on the pages of Scripture, if you understand that he is even more than that, you have a promise to see for eternity. Second, so first, see Christ's identity. Second, submit to God's plan. Follow the example of Mary. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth followed. Uh, They were submitting to God's plan. But God had a different route with Zechariah, not being able to speak. Mary's route of submitting to God's glorious plan, even when she didn't understand, 
presented her with the opportunity to rejoice, as we'll see next time in Luke. This isn't just a passive thing, though. When you hear the word submit, never think passive as far as you don't do anything, as you just kind of sit back and let things happen. Submitting to the Lord's plan means saying, God, you are good. And like Mary said, may it be to me as you have said. What does that mean for us? That means actively living in God's plan for you. And you say, what's God's plan for you? Well, there are specific things that may be unique to every individual here, but there are some things that are absolutely universal. One of those things is living according to God's character. Are you in submission to living according to God's character? His holy and righteous law? Are you in submission to seeking God's good will in this world? Or are you only looking for yourself? You see, we could go down this list. But the truth of the matter is, we need to submit to God's good plan. See Christ's identity, submit to God's good plan, and actively do that. Within the church, being a light and shining in a dark and tasteless world. Know this, though. You will not be alone, and you do not do this under your own strength. Mary was not alone. Gabriel came to declare to her that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her, that the Holy One would be born, would be called the Son of God. What God gives in his plan for you to do, even if it wasn't your first choice, God has promised that he would see you through every step of the way. Let us be encouraged by this. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this, your word. Thank you for the grace that you lavished on your servant. Thank you for the great grace that you lavish on us of being able to carry the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world, to be identified with him in his life and in his death and his resurrection. Father, may you work powerfully by your spirit in and through us according to your good plan. For we pray this in Jesus' name.